The Veiled Chameleon is one of the most spectacular of chameleons, and we in the chameleon community are just lucky that it's one of the most common. Now, considering how common it is, you would think that we would have the husbandry all nailed down. But the fact is, in the last three to four years, it has changed dramatically as we've learned more about their natural habitat. In this video, I'm going to be sharing the latest in husbandry techniques for the veiled chameleon. And I just want to warn you ahead of time that this may contradict some of the things you have seen before. And that's just part of things changing. The majority of husbandry changes have come from one of two reasons. The first is uh, extensive discussions with people who have studied veiled chameleons in their natural habitat in Yemen. And the second is a drive to decrease the amount of infertile clutches and the clutch sizes that are life-threatening to veiled chameleons. And so this care summary reflects all of the changes that incorporate the latest in what we think is the best husbandry for the Veiled Chameleon. You'll be able to download the latest 2002 Veiled Chameleon Care Summary on the chameleonacademy.com website. Just look for the Veiled Chameleon profile. So let's get in and talk about Veiled Chameleons. First, let's take a look at what a Veiled Chameleon is and the differences between the males and females. As adults, it's very easy to tell the difference between the genders. The male has a much more prominent cask. But the real way of telling the difference between male and female is to look at the back feet. There is a hind foot spur that is only in the males. And the nice thing about that is it is present upon hatching. And so you can sex veiled chameleons directly out of the egg. Although male veiled chameleons do get larger than females, the females are a sizable chameleon. And so there's no difference in the caging size between males and females. And truth be told, there isn't even a caging difference between adults and babies. And if that veiled chameleon is big enough to come home with you, it's big enough to go into the adult size cage. In fact, veiled chameleons hatch big enough to go into the adult size cage. You should not worry about your veiled chameleon ever not being able to find food because they are specialists at that. And if you feed your baby at the same time in the same place every day, you will find before long that that baby is sitting and waiting for the food to come. So there's no danger of that baby not knowing where food is in the cage. I have here that the minimum cage size is a two foot by two foot by four foot tall. An alternative is to go wider with the three foot wide, 18 feet deep and three foot tall. But if you're going to do that, make sure you raise the cage up. Actually, with both of these cages, put them up on a counter so that the basking branch is at or above your head level. I do want to say that these minimum cage sizes are driven very much by what cages are available. I would actually much prefer larger cages. And that's what I like for my chameleons. The problem with cage sizes above two foot by two foot by four foot is that the costs go up. But I'll tell you, even six more inches, a 30 inch wide cage would be a dramatic improvement. And so if you are in a position to make your own cage, I encourage you to take advantage of that, of being able to make a cage as big as you can. And if you're handy at all, you could actually take two of those cheap four foot tall screen cages and, and put them together and make a four foot wide by two foot deep by four foot tall cage. That would be a great cage. I have been working with the manufacturing community for a while and I have some behind the scenes knowledge and I look forward to the 2023 care summary being able to have minimum cage sizes that are larger than this and commercially available at a entry level price point. And that's a wonderful example, in my opinion, of our community moving forward. Now, one thing even more important than the size of the cage is what you do with the inside. Even though veiled chameleons can appear to be gregarious and confident sitting on top of their basking branch, it is important that we give them an area that they can go to hide. And so make sure your chameleon has an area of thick foliage. And this area of thick foliage needs to be big enough that the chameleon can go in, find a comfortable place to perch, and be obscured from view. This is critical for your chameleon to be able to feel secure. They may use it for sleeping, they may use it for the mid-afternoon, they may not use it at all, but the important thing is that it's their choice and it's there if they want it. And the important rule of one chameleon per cage definitely applies to veiled chameleons. Do not keep them in pairs, do not keep two females together. Keep each veiled chameleon 
separately in their own cage. So now let's get into the internal environmental conditions and we can start with temperature. Temperature has been one of the huge things that we have had to change in recent years. For the longest time, we in the community were under the impression that veiled chameleons came from a hot, arid place because that's what we think of Yemen as. And when we see pictures of them, they're often they're sitting on a twig in the middle of a barren plain. But that all changed when I started talking to three people that had actually seen veiled chameleons in the wild. And you can listen to them on the Veiled Chameleon profile page on the chameleonacademy.com website. In this podcast series on Veiled Chameleons, I talked to Peter Nechas, Martin Wench, and Petko Dvorak. And they related that these veiled chameleons didn't come from this barren plain. They actually came from high altitude mountain valleys. And during the wet season, these spring to life with foliage and insects. Essentially, it's a mountain paradise. And because they were at high altitudes, the temperatures were actually quite mild. And so our recommended ambient temperatures is in the mid-70s. The basking temperature is in the mid-80s. And because of the high altitude that they live in, we'd love to have the nighttime drop to the upper 50s to low 60s. Now, this has become a problem with the community because the veiled chameleon has a very interesting way of responding to incorrect husbandry conditions. With most chameleons, if you keep them too hot, like the Jackson's chameleon, it'll just simply die on you, and you learn that's not proper husbandry. Veiled chameleons, on the other hand, can absorb the higher temperatures, and what they do is they grow bigger and faster, and they have larger clutches of eggs. And this is where the problem is. With higher temperatures and ample food, the female's body gets supercharged and produces more eggs than her body was designed to handle. You can get clutches from 40 to 60 to even over 100 eggs in a single clutch with a female that's been kept very warm and given ample food. Their body simply takes over and produces relative to the amount of heat and food that they get, even if it's so much that the female's health is in jeopardy. And we know this because just look on the internet and you see how many females become these marble bags and how many females actually die from dystocia or egg binding. They can't get the eggs out. And so we in the community have been working towards figuring out what temperature ranges they should be under. The 85 degrees that I have on this care summary is a safe temperature range. There are a number of breeders working on this problem that are experimenting with an 80 degree basking site. Now there's a reason to be cautious and not jump right into it and that's because the chameleon needs to be able to warm up enough that its body can function and the fact is we don't know exactly where that point is. And so the number that I have here of an 85 degree basking spot is a safe value. But as more and more people try lower and lower temperatures for the basking and show that it is still safe at a lower level, then perhaps next year or the year after, I will change what I have on this care summary. But I'd like to see all of that first to make sure this will be successful for the widest number of people. Humidity is another parameter that has gone through a bit of a renaissance in the last couple of years. In their native Yemen, the cloud banks would flow over the mountains and fill the valleys with a fog, and the chameleons would be immersed in this high humidity area. The benefit of that is that they don't dehydrate and dry out during the night. And so by having a humidity that's 80 to 100% during the night, we keep them from drying out and having to drink as much during the day to rehydrate. Now, this lower humidity during the day, down 40 to 50 percent, the number itself isn't as important as the fact that all the surfaces in the cage dry out. What we're doing is we're getting rid of areas that bacteria, fungus, or mold could uh, start growing and become a problem. Now, reaching these values can be a challenge if you're using a screen cage like is traditionally used in chameleon keeping. You'll find very quickly if your ambient humidity is nowhere near these values that you're not going to be able to hit these values except perhaps a, a small cone of fog under a fogger. If that's your situation, it's time to look into a hybrid cage, which is a cage with solid sides. And don't worry, it's still going to have airflow. Airflow is critical for chameleon health, but you don't need 100% airflow 
all you need is air exchange and the hybrid cages of today do that. So you can either look into a hybrid cage specifically made for this purpose or you can look into putting solid sides on the screen cage that you have now. How much you have to enclose the cage depends upon how dry your ambient humidity is. But there is a direct balance between how humid it is in the night and how much they have to drink during the day. The next parameter is UVB light. And we are lucky because so much of the testing that we've done on uh, uh, chameleons and UVB has been done with veiled chameleons. And so we know that a UV index of three at the basking branch is perfect for a veiled chameleon. As we learned in the video that I did about UVB, to create a proper UVB map within the cage, you need to know what your basking level is and what the maximum level is that you want inside the cage. For veiled chameleons, I've set that at UV index of three for the basking level and a maximum level of 7.4 in the cage. And so the chart that you see here shows how far above the cage you need to put your UVB light so you get 7.4 at the top and then how far down you need the basking branch so the back of the chameleon is in UV index of three. Now the one variable here is that your basking branch has to be placed so your chameleon's back is at UV index of three. So there's a little bit of math that has to be done. Now, as with all of the UVB charts that I produced in the Chameleon Academy, these numbers are with a screen top. So this is where the UVB light is above a screen top. Every screen filters out a certain amount of UVB. The most common screen cages filter out about 30% of the UVB energy, and that is what these numbers reflect. If you're using a cage different than the standard Dragon Strand Rev to Breeze screen cages, then it's worthwhile checking to see what type of screen you have. Now, it is always the case that the most accurate way to set up your UVB levels in your cage is with a solar meter 6.5. And I highly encourage any serious chameleon herpetoculturist to have one in their toolbox. Now here I put together a sample schedule for your lighting and hydration over 24 hours. And if we start at say midnight, this is where the chameleon is safely inside their foliage and is sleeping. We're looking for that high humidity night. And so this is where I want to fog throughout the morning. I'm looking at enveloping this chameleon in this cloud that I'm creating. Now, you'll notice right at the beginning of the fogging session that I have the misters go on. And what I'm doing is I'm coating the cage with water and that allows the fog to stick a little easier. And it doesn't hurt to prime the system, so to speak. I'll fog up until the lights are gonna go on in the morning and, and right before the lights go on, the misters come on again. And once again, put down a layer of dew across the whole cage. So when the chameleon wakes up, they are greeted with a world covered in dew and they can top off whatever hydration they need. Now I use the fogger at night because I need to get up to 80 to 100% humidity. If you live in an area that already has high humidity, well, you don't need the fogger. Remember, all of these things are tools to be able to achieve these uh, parameters that are on the care sheet. And so you use the tools that are appropriate for whatever area you're in. Once it's time for the light to come on, I turn on the main lights. And with this comes the UVB light. I give the chameleon 15, 30 minutes before I turn on the basking light. And that gives the chameleon a chance to, to wake up and slowly make its way up, just like as if the sun was rising. Now with the basking light, what I have here is a gradient. And what that shows is you don't need to have the basking light on all day. In fact, I like to have it on only for as long as the chameleon needs to bask because really they just need that to warm up and start their day. In my situations, all of my T5 lighting, my LED lighting and all of this, that heats up the cage enough that there's no reason for me to have a basking bulb all day. But if you live in a situation where uh, it, it's cool out and you need excess heat during the day, go ahead and leave it on for as long as you need to. And that's what the gradient is. It means do what's right for your situation. What's important is not that you're adhering exactly to the times that I have here, but you understand what I'm trying to achieve by it because your situation is gonna be different than everybody else's situation. And this is trying to get across a concept not a black and white rule. Now you see here later in the afternoon, 
I have a dripping session. And what I'm doing is that I'm testing the hydration of the chameleon. If you want to know more information about hydration, I'm going to link to our video on hydration. But what I'm doing is that I'm seeing if the chameleon wants to drink. If the chameleon wants to drink, then I know I need to give a little bit more hydration. If the chameleon ignores the dripping session, well then, the chameleon's hydrated, and that's really what I like. Of course, I'm also checking the poop to see what the moisture level of the poop is, because I'm doing all of these checks and balances. If you're finding you're needing more hydration, this is the perfect time to have an afternoon rain shower, and you can learn about that in the video on hydration. Once the chameleon's ready to go to bed, I turn off the lights. After the lights go out, sometime in the evening, I'm going to turn on the misters and lay the groundwork for my high humidity night. And this represents a, an idealized day in the life of the chameleon. There is no specific day that this replicates, whether dry season or wet season. It's just an idealized day that's going to be functional throughout the 365 days of the year. Now, I do want to say that there's a lot of work going into figuring out, should we have a wet season conditions and then we have dry season conditions and maybe it's healthy for a chameleon to have those two different seasons during the year. So this is an area where I very well may next year or the year after actually have two sets of conditions for the veiled chameleon over the year. It's just an example of how our husbandry is constantly changing and improving. But for right now, I do know that this one idealized day throughout the entire year does work very well in, in raising up a healthy veiled chameleon. And now we come to feeding. This is a bit of a complicated topic when it comes to veiled chameleons because they will eat a whole lot of things. If it's organic, sometimes even inorganic, and fits into their mouth, even just barely, it's going in. Because they have to grow so fast, they, they have a voracious appetite. Now in the veiled chameleon care summary, I talk about feeding insects. And the correct size for insects is about the size of their head that makes it easy for them to eat and it's safer to go smaller than to go larger but that's a, just a general good rule for the size of the insect you feed and the way to keep a healthy veiled chameleon is to feed about three to five insects that size every other day now you can adjust because if it's a smaller insect you can feed more and of course a bigger insect you just feed less but what you got to remember is a veiled chameleon will want to eat and eat and eat you cannot trust them to stop when they are full. They have this inner drive to just keep eating. And it's a lot of fun to feed them. So, of course, we get them in trouble because we give them more than they need. And that's how we get obese chameleons. And in the case of the females, this is how we get those egg counts up into 60 and 100 eggs. It's by the constant feeding and warm temperatures. What we're looking for is a veiled chameleon that is athletic and is able to navigate in between all of the thorns of the acacia tree. When you see these pictures of these large veiled chameleons with these rotund bodies that can hardly hold themselves up, that's not healthy. Now, one thing everybody knows is veiled chameleons will eat the plants in their cage. How healthy is that? At this time, we don't know why they do that. There are a number of hypotheses. Uh, you know, they, they want the moisture. They want nutrition. Uh, none of those really make sense because if they're getting adequate hydration and they're being fed, they don't need to eat plant matter, which doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients that they need. The best hypothesis that I have heard is that it may be to create roughage. And we know our dogs do this too. Peter Nechas, who's been to Yemen, relates that there were uh, caterpillars all over the place. And if the babies are eating the caterpillars, then there isn't a whole lot to help pass that through the system and plant matter would do that. And so that actually makes a whole lot of sense. The point is that it isn't necessary to give your veiled chameleons plant matter. And in fact, it may be a bad idea if you're giving them fruit because that fruit is designed for human taste and becomes kind of a sugar bomb, which is not good for the chameleon's digestive system. So maybe romaine lettuce, hibiscus flowers, those would be okay. And maybe it provides some sort of mental enrichment for the chameleon to have different food sources like that. But avoid the sugary fruits. Now we go to the other side and people ask about feeding vertebrates because veiled chameleons will take in rodents, lizards, and birds. Well, all I can say is we don't have evidence that that is necessary. So at this time, I'm going to recommend a 100% insect diet. If you want to experiment with plants and vertebrates, then fine, have at it. But the care sheet is going to go with insects. 
When it comes to supplementation, veiled chameleons can be treated as standard chameleons. They don't seem to have an abnormal sensitivity to our supplementations like uh, Jackson's chameleons do. And so things that work with panther chameleons generally will work with veiled chameleons. Although it's interesting, veiled chameleons are high altitude, and so why aren't they sensitive like other high altitude chameleons? I don't have an answer for that. So with supplementation, I give them calcium on every feeding, and then every other week, I give them a dusting of a supplement that has vitamin A. My favorite supplement at this time is the Rupashi Calcium Plus Low D, because that has moderate amounts of the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin D3 and vitamin A. During the everyday feedings of the calcium, sometimes I'll add in bee pollen. I like to make my own concoction of 50% calcium and 50% crushed bee pollen. Alternatively, I've used Arcadia Earth Pro A, which has bee pollen and calcium, as well as a number of carotenoids. One critical component of this supplementation schedule is that you have strong UVB, that UV index of three that we talked about. That is where the chameleon is getting the vitamin D3. Supplementing every other week with a multivitamin is not going to give your chameleon enough vitamin D3. So be aware that supplementation and UVB are partners in the nutrition of your chameleon. And the third partner in that is proper nutrition of your feeders. Assume that the crickets you got from the store or wherever you got them were not fed properly. So before you feed them to your chameleon, make sure you give them 24 to 48 hours of a rich grains, fruits, vegetables, and make sure that those crickets are as nutritious as possible for your chameleon. They will thank you for that by being healthy long-term. So that covers your basic husbandry of a veiled chameleon. You'll notice in the care summary though, there are more sections. There's a section on breeding, there's a section on medical, and each of these could easily take up an entire video, which we will do in the future. At this time, you can find the details for those on the chameleonacademy.com website. Just go to the link that you see on top of the care sheet. And I wanna let you know that these care summaries are there for you to use and pass around. If you end up breeding veiled chameleons and you sell babies and you want a care sheet, you are welcome to use this care sheet with the caveat that you don't change anything on it. Your customer will have a link to a website, a QR code that will take them to that website that will have a lot more details. And then this way, your customer has a place that they can go to to do research. This coupled with handholding by you is a powerful team. Now I'd like to talk about how care sheets should be used. This care sheet is just a starting point. What this care summary does is gives you a baseline. These conditions have been successful for a majority of people with veiled chameleons out there. The thing is, these are generalized. And so this just gives you a starting point. Once you have all of this set up, then it's time to listen to your chameleon. Some chameleons will need more hydration. They will need to be in the basking lamp longer. And it's important that you give that to them when they tell you that they need it. Is the poop always dry? Well, then give them more hydration. Don't worry if it means that you have to give more than what's on my schedule. Your chameleon is the expert. If your chameleon needs more heat, give them more heat. You just have to be responsible enough to know that maybe it's giving it to them longer. If you give them too much, they may burn themselves. And so you've got to be responsible in this. But the point is you listen to your chameleon. Do not be afraid to do something that's not on this care summary. Remember, this is just your starting point. The second thing I'd like to talk about is that veiled chameleon husbandry is changing more rapidly than it has in the past. And so there are a lot of care sheets out there that will say different things. People come back from the vet saying that their vet told them something different. In all of these cases, someone took a care sheet that was relevant and up to date for when they got it, and they've stuck with that information since then. So you cannot expect everyone out there to be as up to date. And some people have simply done things the way they've done it for years and years and years, and they don't want to change. And so we need to come to terms with the fact that not everybody out there is going to agree. In fact, a great number of them will disagree. What do you do when you're caught in the middle of this? You have 
three different people that you respect saying different things. And this is the challenge of a newcomer, especially in the social media world. My advice to you is research the people giving you the information. Where do they get their information? And then decide which one you want to go with. If you have a breeder, I recommend going with what your breeder says, even if your breeder is saying something different than what I have here. The thing is, your breeder is going to be hand-holding you through the process, and if you expect to go to your breeder for help, you need to do it their way. It's okay. We don't need to have all of our methods matching. Once you get your feet under you and you understand what's going on, then you're free to go and take a look at other methods and see which one you like. But the way to navigate all of this confusion is not to accept that one is 100% right and will never change. Just accept that wh whichever one that you chose is the way that you're going to do it until you know better. And while your chameleon is enjoying life and zapping crickets, you can leisurely look at all the other different methods. And when you feel confident enough that you can make a different decision, then you can start tweaking what you do. The Chameleon Academy is a special case because I make it a point to give all of the evidence, all the reasons why I came to the conclusions that I did. And if you follow the advice that I give in the, my care summaries, I want it to be because you have looked at all of the evidence and you've said, yeah, this makes sense. I've gone through a lot of effort to make sure that you can understand why it is that we do this. And that way you don't have to say, well, well, Bill said it. That's why I'm doing it. No, no, no. You can understand it yourself. You can own it and you can explain this is why I'm doing it. And that's what I want the Chameleon Academy to be. I want to produce chameleon herpetoculturists that understand why they're doing what they're doing and are able to explain it. Thank you very much for joining me here. It's been a lot of fun talking about veiled chameleons. If you have more questions about veiled chameleon husbandry, go to chameleonacademy.com and check out the profile section and click on the Veiled Chameleon. There you're gonna find a detailed profile summary that's gonna have a list of all of these videos as well as a podcast and that care summary sheet that you can download for free. I wish you the best with your Veiled Chameleon and this is Bill Strand signing off. I'll see you next time.